All right, let's keep the train rolling with the life and suffering of Sir Bronte. I am out of recorded videos, so I've got some work to do. Bonds of friendship. You return to the lodging house one last time to gather your belongings for the move to your new home. The young man dressed in the uniform of the military academy greets you by the door. It takes you a moment to recognize Thomas. Your friend locks you in an embrace. Bronte, hey, how are you? I heard about the nasty stuff that went down in the college square. Those damn gentry would do anything to keep lowborn folks under their thumb. Glad the situation resolved itself. As for me, I'm an academy cadet now. He is beaming with pride. You invite him in and chat while you pack. Thomas continues to relay the news as you walk up the stairs. I made it into the top ten. Can you can you imagine? Did pretty well in spar sparring and the sciences. It was all thanks to the help you gave me back in school in Anazote. I'll be studying the art of war now, and then it's quick march to the noble title. How about you? You tell Thomas about what happened over the past few days and of the path you have chosen. He, he remains quiet as you speak. Both of you realize that you may never see each other again. You know, Bronte, here's what I think. You may have your own path in life, but you are my friend. We gotta make sure our friendship lasts forever, no matter what happens to us. Here, I brought two brass rings. If the old tradition is to be believed, both the rings and their rarers will always remain close to each other, no matter where fate takes them. What do you say? The two of you grew up side by side. Thomas, the audacious, hot-blooded, sharp-tongued boy who used to live next door. You can't imagine your childhood without him. But would it be right to promise him that your friendship will last forever, no matter what happens? Two rings made of plain brass lie in his open palm. If you wear these rings, you will be bound by ties of friendship for the rest of your life. Well, who on earth would want to end the friendship? You can take the ring. Keep things... No, I can't take the ring. Keep things the way they are, or swear an oath of friendship. Well, gosh, what is this world without friends? I feel like we must swear an oath of friendship. You take the ring that will bind your fate to Thomas's and swear an oath of eternal friendship. A little weird, not gonna lie. You take one of the rings from his outstretched palm. The two of you have walked side by side ever since you were children. Even now, you are walking in the same direction toward a noble title. You as a judge and Thomas as a warrior. Nothing will ever tarnish your bond. You swear an oath to eternal friendship to Thomas. Okay, a little weird. Thomas solemnly swears the same. You put the brass ring on your pinky. A perfect fit. Thomas follows suits. He starts beaming again. Now we're friends forever. For all eternity. We gotta celebrate this. Come, come. I know a place. I gotta show you. Tastiest meat I've ever tried, Bronte. My treat. Oh, that's nice. Free drinks. The two of you go to a noble salon by the square of Emperor Severin. Surrounded by tobacco smoke and mead bottles, you wag your tongues, recall the days of your adolescence, and make plans for the future. Nobody knows what could be waiting for you, but you promise you will never lose sight of each other. It's like we're married now or something. Okay, you and Thomas form an unbreakable bond of friendship. Eleven thirty-five, fall. A letter from home. As soon as you are accepted into the Imperial College, you send a letter back home. The family qu replies quickly. Their letter arrives in under a week. Most of it is covered with your father's handwriting. I am proud of you, my son, and I believe your grandfather takes pride in you too. You have brought our family one step closer to being ennobled by the sword. You will make an excellent judge. I have complete faith in your intellect and your will. You shall bring glory to our family. Stephen's congratulations follows your father's. Congratulations, brother. The simple folk could only dream of what you have already achieved. You can thank father and grandfather for this opportunity, but it was you who proved yourself worthy. Once you receive your new lot, you and I will be equals at last. Suck an egg, Stephen. 
Then, some words of praise from Mother and Nathan. You have brought your father much joy and made him proud, and I am witness to this. You now walk the path, you now walk this path all thanks to him. Yet it saddens me that you did not consider the divine seminary, where you could have dedicated your life to the gods as well as the empire himself, itself. I'm sorry, Mom, I don't want to be a priest. You worked hard for this. We held a big feast in your honor back home. I hope you achieved all you've ever wanted. And at the very end, there's a small note from your sister. From your sister. Congratulations. Good luck. Quite cold, sister dear. Well, we are max with our father. Plus one with Steven. Minus one with Gloria. There's nothing uh, about mom and me. The ball. It is only a few days since you became a student at the college. Your education has barely begun when an amazing piece of news surprises all of the students. Every year, Tor Cornelius Tempest, the great chancellor of the emperor's younger brother, grants an honor to all future nobles of the mantle and invites them to a masquerade at his summer palace. The professors and lecturers instruct you to look and act your best in order to preserve the college's honor. They tell you more about the ball, too. All who attend it from the college must prove themselves with word or deeds to the members of the great Archean dynasties that will be present there. This means the reputation of your home province will be at stake too. It's time to get ready. You order a proper suit for the occasion and a mask to go with it. It looks simple, but by no means plain. It only hides your eyes. The day comes. You spend an entire morning preparing for the ball. Your fellow students give you hints about how to attach the cuffs, keep the collar straight, and make sure your hair remains coiffed for the entire night. That's very important. Gotta stay coiffed. Soon, the carriages start flocking to Cornelius Tempest's summer palace. The tall, ornate outer fence surrounds a sprawling garden of, in full bloom. The marble-paved driveway is so wide it can accommodate two rows of carriages. You and your fellow students walk up the massive stairs to the front door of the palace. You seem tiny and incongruous against the background of the scenic grandeur. The master of ceremonies instructs all newcomers to seek their province's coat of arms. You see the banner of Margra from far away, depicting the silver tree dipping its roots into the murky gray soil. Below it is a banner bearing the coat of arms of the Milanidus dynasty. It turns out students from the college were not the only ones invited to this party. You see academy cadets lined up beneath the banners too, and Thomas is among them. A wide grim appears on his face when he sees you under the banner of Magra. I just knew you'd be here today, pal. What can I say? Congratulations, student. As for me, I'm not so bad myself, see? The military academy is father and mother to me now. You're, uh... Patriotism is duly noted, Thomas. Thank you. <laughs> His merry speech is interrupted by a tall, proud Archean in a heavy cloak. You recognize him. He is Dorius Otten, Sophia's former master. Make way for your commander, soldier. Soldiery. The last time you saw Otten, he was searching the back streets of Anazote by your house for a, ser a girl servant. But now the young Archean's uniform betrays his high standing. He is young. Yet he is already the province's commander. Who put him in charge of all the military forces of Margaret at such an age? What's wrong? You know him or something? A brief description of Otten is enough to wipe the smile off his face. You see no other high-ranking officials bearing the colors of Margaret at this party. It seems Dorius Otten will be the main representative of your province tonight. You watch the other college students and academy cadets line up under the provincial banner banners. The blue and silver banners of Archnea, the emperor's own province, is in the very center of the hall. Judging by the hilts jutting out from beneath the, their belts, many of those who surround that banner are nobles of the sword. Thomas is clearly jealous. The group from Archnea stands proudly, ennobled by its iconic and dignified history. The Archnean race and the empire originated in their very lands. A sizable group of students stand under a banner of Monia, a wealthy agricultural province signified by yellow grains on a field of ore. The wealth of the young men be beneath, beneath this banner is plain to see. 
Their attire is on par with the Arkneams in terms of luxury, and perhaps even more vibrant in terms of color. The most numerous group of the party stands under the banner of Illyria, a yellow griffin against the field of azure. All the Illyrians are clothed in well-tailored suits with a minimum of decoration. Some of them wear gloves. Most of them come from wealthy industrial families. And it seems many of them would feel more at ease in their family factories than at a noble party like this one. Three banners represent the northern province of Fiona, Hermia, and Constanta. These banners, like the groups associated with them, stand together. The Royal Tempest Dynasty oversees all three of them. The students and cadets are clearly well off, yet they are dressed in modest functional garments to honor the austere traditions of the North. For the North. And finally, the smallest of the group is represented by an open book against against Field of Ardent, Argent, Astinia, homeland of, homeland of the Diamant Dynasty. By the order of Patriarch Junius Diamant, the open book of the new faith has been added to the banner only recently. Nearly all the young men beneath this banner are cloaked in academy uniforms. They wear no adornments, but are clad impeccably, with nary a button undone, the embodiment of rigor and restraint. The master of ceremonies signals the beginning of the party. It is time for dancing. The first dance is a minuet, and, a t and tradition calls for everyone to dance. Harpsichord music fills the hall. The academy cadets waste no time finding dance partners, and soon already, and soon already making the fluid first step of the minuet. You take a look around. One of the young ladies representing Margra catches your eye. She is slender, like all Arcanians, and clothed in a yellow dress embroidered with emerald green. Her face hidden behind a full mask decorated with bright green feathers. Phew. Keep going. What happens next seems unbelievable. The enigmatic lady walks towards you. The way she looks at you. The way she walks. The black eyes from behind the mask watch you closely. She tilts her head. There are no words, but you feel there is a question. Everyone in the hall is startled by a sudden noise. You look behind you and see Thomas getting up off the floor, his face a grimace of rage. Dorius Otten stands before him, eyeing him with disgust. His arm rests on the hilt of his sword. Who allowed this clumsy commoner inside the great chancellor's palace? Its noble masters are trying to dance, and it's getting underfoot. Well, that's not very nice. Thomas is my goofy friend. Thomas looks like he is about to explode in Otten's face. But the smug Arcnean's, Arcnean's sword is a clear threat. If your friend's rage gets the better of him, he will end up in trouble. The enigmatic Arcnean beauty, however, quickly loses all interest in their quarrel. She comes even closer to you, expecting you to invite her to dance. Okay, so... We can resolve the quarrel. Draw Aten's ire upon yourself. Or we can dance with the mysterious lady. Thomas, my friend. I think you're on your own. Dance with the mysterious lady. You seize the day and dance with the beguiling Arcnean lady. Surely Thomas can take care of himself. Ah, I'm sure he'll be fine. You turn your head towards the Arcnean beauty and offer her your hand, taking care not to rush your movements. A moment later, her fingers gracefully come to rest in yours. The masked lady's touch feels electric against your skin. You walk toward, together towards the center of the hall, where the other couples, couples are already dancing. You bow, and she makes a curtsy. Her hands are incredibly thin. They seem so delicate. You fear you might snap them if you squeeze too hard. You adjust to her steps, counting the rhythm of the music. Your lady for the dance is an Arcnian, a noble born to rule. Yet this is a dance, where you must take the lead. As you walk around her, your eyes catch an embroidered ornament on the arm of her dress. You spy many thin emerald threads, all interwoven into a pattern of interlocking snakes. This young woman is Octavia Milanitis, daughter of the Archduke of the Home Province. The minuet ends. You bow to the lady and offer to accompany, accompany her wherever she chooses before the next dance. Why? Then be so kind as to accom accompany me for another dance. Before you know it, the night is almost over. Octavia will not let you go. She does not accept another invitation until she has danced with you three times. You spot Thomas in the crowd during a break. He catches your eye and salutes you with a wine glass. Judging from his lopsided grin, 
Otten must have had him removed from the dance floor. But any concern for your friend is forgotten when you see the beautiful Octavia approaching you again. Yeah. See you later, Thomas. <laughs> Okay, next year. Oh, a lot of reading on that one. 1136, winter. The trial of the 50. You have lived another year in the capital. Eterna has been shaken by what is known as the trial of the 50. 50 people stand trial at once, all prominent members of several political circles. They are accused of treason and conspiracy against the crown. The accused spoke in favor of reducing the power of the nobles and granting more rights to the common estate. There were, there were no mention of rebellion, yet those words alone were enough to indict them. Every session of the trial is open to the public. It is a show of power made to discourage people from forming such circles ever again. You attend one of these sessions. The 50 face their verdict, forced labor in the minds of Magra and Illyria for regular members, and true death for their leaders, six men and one woman. Their public execution takes place in the central square of Eterna. You remember the woman. Her name was Annie Siren. She made a speech before her execution. A young woman, not too tall, her face almost plain, with long bangs over her eyes. She looks calm, even at this moment. You cannot believe she is about to leave this world forever. Annie Siren takes a look around before she speaks. Her voice is quiet, but you are close enough to hear every single word. She shed, she shed. She says she is happy to give her lives, her lives fight. Oh, okay, that's right. We have multiple lives in this game. Her lives fighting for the right of the people. Her cause will never die. Annie claims. Others like her will continue their work, in hiding, for their cause is right and just. She is dragged away to the others. They put a sack over her head and tighten a noose around her neck. A hand yanks on the lever, and the seven dangle in the air. Their feet tremble at first, then grow still. There are gasps and cries of discontent in the crowd. Okay, well, power goes back down, and order goes back up. Sir L. Croy's lesson. Your studies at the Imperial College may have begun with a luxurious party, but soon you settle into a routine of lesson after lesson. Along with dozens of other future ju judges, you spend hours listening to lectures in spacious college halls with high ceilings. You study Imperial law and legislation, analyzing every technicality and interpretation. The subjects only get tougher, and the instructors grow even more demanding as your studies continue. Yet law is not the only thing you study. There are other disciplines as well, such as rhetoric and ortho orthography. There you go, orthography. A true judge must have a perfect command of both the spoken and written word. Washing blue dark ink off your fingers, dark blue ink off your fingers, becomes an indelible part of your daily routine. All your classes, you find the fencing lessons particularly exciting. Every lesson covers your body with more cuts and bruises. It makes your muscles ache from exertion. But your childhood dream is worth it. Then, finally, there comes a short break in your studies. A handful of days for rest and recreation. You meet Thomas to discuss how you are going to spend this time. You're coming with me tonight. No excuses, Bronte. We'll be playing, paying a visit to our mentor, Baron Elcroy. It's time you learned a thing or two about how we do things in the military. Well, I guess I don't have a choice here. Your friend looks very cunning and pleased with himself when he says this. With a sigh, you change out of your college uniform and into your best clothes and follow him. Thomas rushes you to a two-story house somewhere in a noble neighborhood in the capital. Its windows are open, and you can hear people talking over each other. The house's sitting room is filled with young people, at least two dozen men, almost all of them academy cadets. In the middle of the sitting room is an armchair, and in this armchair is a gentleman wearing the uniform of an, an Imperial Legion officer and smoking a pipe. His thick hair falls over his large observant eyes. I see no pipe in this photo. 
Baron Elcroy welcomes the two of you with a slight nod and continues his speech while everyone listens respectfully. As I was saying, young men, I firmly believe that the days when all the military glory of the Empire belonged to the Archean dynasties are long gone. Human nobles have been serving the Empire Emperor as long as at least as well as the Archean nobles, for as long for a long time now. Still, the Archneans keep acting like their origins are more important than honor and service to the crown. Take the Milanitis dynasty, for example. The Archdukes of Magra, long ago, their leader, Char Milanitis, fomented a rebellion against the rule of the Tempests and the Twins' faith. He sucked all life from his own land, doomed thousands of his own subjects, and yet the Milanitis dynasty still rules over Magra like nothing ever happened. Then, suddenly, Sir Elcroy flashes a cunning grin. I think this calls for a test of your strategic thinking, young men. But first, let me refresh your memory of the rebellion of Char Milanitis. It may seem surprising, but we have him to thank for our current status. He was the first to ennoble humans, an act of unprecedented insolence. But it gave the rebellious duke immense support in his province. He risked his own reputation and title to make himself stronger thanks to humans. And in that, he succeeded. No one has ever dared challenge the rule of the Archings and the Tempests before. But the rebellion of Margaret changed everything. Humans became a part of the nobility. We got a taste of the power only the Archings could wield before. And, unless I'm mistaken, most nobles of the Empire these days are human. Why, we outnumber the members of the Archean dynasties dozens of times over. So, Char Milanitis had complete rule and control of the lands of Margra. He had the loyalty of, a, of his ennobled human subjects, and, as he, and he had the loyalty of the mages and witches who fled to Anazote, the only place in the empire where they could hide from the church. The Archduke of Magra had everything he needed to win, and yet two pivotal changes brought him down. First of all, he cast a magic spell that incinerated the entire province. It certainly stopped the imperial legions in their tracks. But the population of Margra would no longer side with Charmelanitis after that. Second, the clergy struck at the rebellious duke with the power of the twins. His magic was gone, and his main advantage was no more. Many fled. But, as you know, it still took the Empire an entire month of siege before the palace of Anazote was taken. After the rebellion of Margra, the Empire changed drastically. And, more importantly, humans finally received their lawful right to be ennobled. And, I'd like to stress that, in particular, ennobled not by birth, but by virtue of their own knowledge and talent. History, young men, is more than just a memory of the past. It is also a lesson for our future. I believe that part of our history proves my point. And now, a test. Tell me, if you were among the Imperial strategists during the, re the Rebellion, what would you have done? Would you have fought an enemy as powerful as Char Melanitis? With this, Sir Elcroy leans back in his armchair and takes a puff from his pipe while the cadets start discussing. Take some time. Take some take no time to say they cannot believe Sir Elcroy thinks humans were first ennobled by serving the rebellious duke. Others say the prolonged palace siege might have been a mistake, and storming the palace would have been a better choice. Soon, ideas start flying. Some cause only laughter, while others lead to debate. They are discussing the past of Anazote. The past of your hometown. You cannot possibly stay silent now. If you were in command of the Imperial Legions back then, what would you have done? Based on what you know about the Rebellion of Margra, you see three potential strategies. The first involves calling upon the Twins' as miracles to rob Melanitis of magic and render him powerless. Okay. The second entails putting your faith in the dis discipline and valor of your army for a frontal assault. The third meaning draws out the siege while making the enemy's life as hard as possible through cunning. Which of these three strategies would you have chosen? Okay, rely on the wills of the twins. I don't think so. Press for a decisive assault or lay siege to the palace. Just looking at these, this choice would get us to 10 in both valor and scheming, so I quite like the idea of that. My eloquence is so low, I don't think I even want to bother with it, and I don't really like the idea of this choice, so I think I'm going to lay siege to the palace. You would have starved the city into submission and seized it by cunning.
You decide it is time for your an for you to answer Sir Elcroy. The proper way to bring down the castle of Anazote would have been through the prolonged siege, you say. The lands of Margra can no longer feed the warriors of Charmelanitis at the stage of the rebellion. And when their supplies eventually ran out, you you would they would have opened their gate from the inside. Sir Elcroy looks at you, studying you at attentively. I agree with what you're saying, young Bronte, in a sense. Had the Imperial forces done that, they would have lost fewer men and kept their palace in of Anizote intact. Yet, you are missing my other point here. Milanitis' army would have continued fighting, even emaciated by the siege, even with their numbers dwindling. True, some did flee, but those who stayed to defend the city and the castle, even after the Imperial forces broke in, remained loyal to their lord until the very end. Long ago, only Arcneans had the right to wield weapons and wage war, but now humans can, pr can prove their merit and earn the same rights humans like ourselves, and the present empire has grown even stronger thanks to its new warriors and function functionaries. These days, humans can judge and rule and create. The terrors wrought by the rebellious duke are undeniable, yet his rebellion created new possibilities for all of us. And this, young men, is the moral of the story. Char Milanitis was defeated, but not by the clergy and their prayers and not even by the noble militias assembled by the other archdukes. He was vanquished by the Imperial Legions, a unified army with clear regulations and ranks, and a clear chain of command, an army that is strong in discipline and loyalty to the Emperor. His eyes finally move away from you and back to the rest of the young men in the hall, but nobody else dares to argue with the battle-hardened officer. The evening continues. Sir Elcroy shares some of his war stories, each more astounding than the last. For the rest of the night, you are out of the Baron's center of attention, and so you join Thomas and the other cadets in sipping wine and enjoying his tales. You return to the college long after midnight. You often recall, recall Baron Elcroy's stories about the re rebellion of Charmelanitis after that. The rebellious duke lost the war, and yet he brought about drastic changes for humans and the Empire. Okay. Well. I'm going to take a look at these, because we're kind of at a point where we're getting close to where I want to end it. Patriarch Cassius. Not sure about him. There's the map again. Relationships. Oh, we have some more relationships. Father Ulrich. Dorius Otten. Gian. Haven't seen her in a while. Octavia. Augustine Elborn. Sophia and Thomas. Family, none of that's changed. Our photo may have changed a little. Eh, I can't remember, that would be the same. But we have tarnished honor, a wealth of five, moderate means, and there is peace in our family, and Stephen is the heir. So, 11, 10, 8, 5, 11, 10. We're quite well, well rounded, I would think. Take one look at this destiny page. Path of Nobleman, got that. Bond of Friendship, got that. And I'm pretty sure there's more to come here, so... Yeah. Alright. Let's hit continue. But I don't think I'm going to continue. Well, actually, I will continue. I'll read this. 1136, Summer. Letters from Home. There are days when you receive letters from home. Father's writing is very reserved. He mostly discusses event, events and work in Margra and writes very little about the family. It makes me proud that I have managed to teach Stephen how to handle our affairs at home. Your older brother behaves impeccably at the society balls and receptions that we host. He has already made several crucial acquaintances. But Gloria has a different opinion of Stephen. She thinks your older brother is taking more and more after Grandfather. Well, that's not good. Stephen is a lot like Grandfather. It's in his manners, his posture, his voice. He even dresses just like him. He used to be aloof around me, and we barely talked in the past. But now he always blames me and tears, and tears me apart. I can't take it anymore. He walks all over me all the time and treats me like a housemaid. Yeah, that sucks. 
I feel for you, Gloria. Mother writes to you. From her letters, you learn that Nathan just barely managed to graduate from school. Ooh. It makes me sad to admit that Nathan has none of your talents you have. The other day... <laughs> oh, that's kind of harsh, Ma. <laughs> the other day, he told me he won't even try to study in the capital. He says he won't be able to pass the exams. I find solace only in the nights Nathan and I spent together reading the scriptures and our walks to the church by the silver tree. He, accompan he accompanies me every time. Your sister and younger brother write about mother too, and they say the same thing about her health. She now spends more time locked away in her chambers to brood. Gloria does her best to accompany mother when she leaves home, and Nathan's letters mention her steps echoing in the halls in the middle of the night. There's one more thing Nathan mentions in his letters. Stephen and Gloria have been fighting very often these days. Stephen always tries to get under Gloria's skin, and she answers him in kind. Then Stephen calls her a lowly commoner to make her shut up. You always tremble in excitement each time you see a new letter with the seal of your home province. Your fate is still bound tightly to your families, no matter the dis distance between you. Okay, great. Uh, negative one for no reason? I guess because we're away. <laughs> Alright, with that, I think this is a good place to end it, given the time. So thanks for watching, I appreciate it. More to come. I love you. Not really.